Hello and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Kendall Hillegas and I am a full-time freelance illustrator and artist. Uh, this is part two, uh, a long overdue part two, in my uh, series on reference images. And the first one was about using other people's reference image or other people's photos as reference images. So basically using photos that you find online and kind of how to go about that the right way and the legal implications of some of that. And uh, that's a whole separate freestanding video. So even though that was part one, you don't have to watch it first, but if that is something you're interested in or if this video has come up in a search and that's actually what you're wondering about using other people's reference images, I will have that link uh, in the description box so you can uh, watch this one and then watch Watch that one or vice versa or whatever but the point is this one is freestanding as well so even if you haven't seen part one you're gonna be fine so this video will be more of a general guide on taking your own photos to use as reference images so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the kind of general principles that I use or that I follow when I'm taking uh, reference photos as well as some of the more specific ones that I use when I am taking reference photos of food since food illustration is a large part of what I do. Before we dive in, I do want to say a quick thank you to my patrons. They are uh, supporting my channel financially to make it possible for me to make videos. So as a, a full-time freelance artist, the time that I spend making videos is something that I absolutely love doing, but it takes me away from um, paying client work. So uh, my patrons provide that support and make it possible for me to create these videos and to have help with editing. So uh, thank you very much to my patrons. And uh, if you are interested in supporting this channel as well, uh, you can find a link to uh, my Patreon page in the description box. All right, let's dive in. All right, so first I want to talk about my seven general rules for shooting reference images. And this would be true for uh, really any subject, whether it's food or animals or people, botanicals, whatever. These are just sort of general overarching rules for, for taking reference photos. So number one is to shoot in natural light whenever possible. Uh, if you have looked into this subject at all before, I'm sure you've already heard this one. It's one of the most common things that people say as a piece of advice for taking good reference images. And uh, it is, to, in my mind, the most important. And the reason it's important to have natural light over lamp light is that natural light is gonna showcase the true colors of the work um, in a way that more reflects what they're really like in reality as opposed to different kinds of lamp light which are just gonna uh, skew the color in one way or another and that doesn't mean that you can never take photos by uh, lamp light or indoors um, but it just makes for, from my perspective it makes the job a little bit harder especially when it comes down to interpreting the colors in the reference so obviously the ideal would, would always be that you could draw from life not even from a reference image but if you are gonna be drawing from from a reference image you want that reference to be as close to real life as possible uh, that is if you're trying to make realistic work if you're not trying to make realistic work then it's less important but uh, if you're trying to make realistic work having the reference be as close to the real thing um, which is definitely impacted by the kind of light you shoot in uh, and then the other side note on light on this point is to try to have it be a, a single uh, source or a one main source. So, um, you know, if you have, if you're shooting in a room like this, for example, where I have got a window on one side of me right here and then a window on another side, those are both light sources. So if the subject was sitting where I'm sitting, it's going to be lit from multiple different directions. Um, and again, you can do that and that, that will make it look realistic in some ways because that's how um, we see most things in real life. But especially if you're just getting started with drawing and you're really trying to learn to understand uh, value and form, having just a single light source can be really helpful. So sometimes what I do if, if I am taking reference photos in this room is I'll close one of these windows so that I just have the light coming from one side. So number two is to keep the full subject in focus. So uh, you may see different food images online um, that where 
kind of the front part of it is in focus and the back part of it is a little bit blurry and has that really pretty kind of bokeh effect. So uh, in photography terms, that would mean it has a shallow depth of field. So only, the, only a little bit of the image is in focus or only part of the image is in focus. And I love those photos. I think they're beautiful. They are very uh, trendy right now, really in style. Um, but they don't really make great reference images. And that's because, say, if you're drawing something like a donut, you know, if, if that donut has sprinkles on it, let's imagine that. If you have only the sprinkles that are in the foreground in focus, the sprinkles that are kind of further in the back of the donut, if those are a little bit blurry or not in focus, they're just not gonna have as much information for you to work from. And again, you can work around this too. I have certainly worked around it in the past myself when I didn't have a choice for the kind of image that I was using. Um, but uh, it's my strong preference to have something where the entire image is in focus because again, it just gives you more information just like if the, the subject was actually sitting in front of you in real life. And on a similar note, I try to keep the whole subject in frame. So even if I think I might be cropping some of it out or only using part of it, uh, shooting the entire subject without any cropping just gives you more information to work from later on and you can always decide to leave certain parts Parts of it out or um, yeah make that decision as you're actually drawing it as opposed to while you're taking the photo and then once you're stuck with the photo you, there isn't really anything else you can do so um, in natural light fully in focus the full subject in frame uh, all right number four so generally speaking I try to keep at least 18 to 24 inches away from the subject so, and it might be even further depending on what it is, but uh, if you get too close, then you can end up kind of having a little bit of a, a curved at the image, depending on the kind of camera you're using or a smartphone, the image uh, might have some evidence that it's a photo as opposed to um, looking just like you drew it from life. So, uh, and, and that might be actually something that you would want to create. Some people want to create that kind of almost fisheye effect. But, um, but from my perspective, keeping, um, keeping a further perspective, um, for my taste rather, keeping a little bit of a, a further distance from the subject lets me get the whole thing in, in camera, in frame without any visual distortion. So uh, 18 to 24 inches. And number five is to be aware of the perspective that you're using. So um, I typically like uh, what's called a three-quarter perspective. So it's not directly, uh, not directly ahead, not directly over, not directly on the side, but kind of angled a little bit uh, to give a good sense of the dimensionality of the subject. Now, it doesn't mean that I always use that perspective, but uh, it tends to be a good place to start. And some of the other perspectives, the directly head on or directly above, um, they may seem like they're easier in a way, um, but it can be trickier to make those look realistic since they're more likely to appear flat uh, once you've actually done the painting. And number six is actually kind of related to, to number five, and that is to try taking multiple pictures from multiple different angles and perspectives. So, you know, say you have uh, a few that you like of the three quarter view, you might try the three quarter on one side, the three quarter on another side, and then just for kicks, you might try few that are directly overhead, directly front facing or directly side facing. So um, having, taking as many different versions as possible um, because one may look good while you're taking it and you may think, oh yeah, this is great. But then when it comes time to actually interpreting that into a drawing or a painting, you may find that you wish you had more information or had tried a different perspective. So, um, and most of us are taking reference photos with digital cameras or smartphones. So there's really no reason not to take as many as possible. And number seven, uh, I feel like this is also kind of related, but that is generally speaking, I try to take more than I think I need and I am always on the lookout. So um, for the most part, I take my reference images pretty much just with my iPhone and I have the iPhone, I have the iPhone 8 plus, but even when I had earlier models for quite a while, the iPhone camera has been more than adequate for, for my reference photo purposes and I always have it with me. 
which means that, you know, if I'm in the grocery store or at a bakery or in a garden or um, at a restaurant, really wherever, wherever I am, if there's an opportunity for a good reference image, um, I can just snap that up, take a bunch of different photos um, from all these different angles and, uh, and save those for later, even if I don't have a specific purpose in mind when I take the photo. Those are my seven kind of general rules for, um, for taking reference images and how I take reference images. And I mentioned this a couple of times as I was talking through it, but um, of course you can work around many of these things like shooting in, in lamp light versus shooting in natural light or um, shooting with a slightly blurry photo versus shooting with a photo that, um, excuse me, working from a slightly blurry photo versus working from one that where the entire subject is in focus. Um, same thing with the different perspectives. Really any of these things can be worked around and I do sometimes work around them, but especially if you're just getting started or if you're just wanting to make your life easier, I find that, that following most of those uh, rules most of the time will uh, really go a long way. Okay, so now a few pointers that are specifically geared towards uh, reference photography for food illustration or for food paintings. So we have five basic tips, and the first one is to be sure to choose subjects that actually look like food or that are immediately recognizable as food. So think of things like, you know, a Danish pastry or ramen or um, tacos or a lollipop, something that people are going to see and immediately be able to read as food. Uh, the inverse of that is that you want to steer clear from subjects that don't immediately look like food. So things like, um, think about kind of the more fine dining restaurants, the um, kind of modernist cuisine where you, know, you might have, <clears throat> excuse me, like carrots or asparagus or something that don't even look like carrots or asparagus anymore, or the different really um, almost sculptural little terrines and shaped food. They're absolutely beautiful. I love looking at photos of, of those kinds of uh, foods. And I have drawn some of them in the past myself, especially for uh, clients. Sometimes they're needed for editorial purposes, but uh, when those images are out of context, it can be difficult for viewers to see that it's food. Similar, uh, a similar subject would be, um, again, really beautiful and really cool. Uh, some of those more sculptural cakes where a cake is made to look like, you know, a handbag or a football or something. Uh, they are really interesting, really um, cool in and of themselves, but they don't make the best subjects for um, for freestanding food illustration. Uh, just try to picture if your illustration is just on a wall somewhere without any context or explanation. Um, in that context, you want someone to be able to immediately recognize it as food. All right, so number two is to choose subjects that have uh, a good amount of color and contrast, especially when you're painting plated food. In my experience, it's just really tough to make big piles of different beige or white or brown foods look appetizing. If there isn't color, if there isn't contrast, uh, different textures, uh, you may have the same problem that you would have when painting kind of the the more abstract or, or subjects that look less like food. The same problem from um, from point number one that is uh, sometimes just big piles of bland colored foods won't immediately look like food to the viewer. And number three is to select imperfect foods. So if you're painting an apple, choose the apple that's like not quite perfectly round or that has a little spot on it or a head of cabbage if, if, you're, if you're painting cabbage choose the cabbage with a little tear in the leaf or um, a little green part at the edge. Uh, choosing subjects that have those inherent imperfections, to me it just makes it number one more visually interesting because it breaks things up from the norm, it looks a little bit um, less expected, and then also it just makes it look more lifelike, more um, authentic and, and realistic, and uh, yeah, including, you know, if you're painting an ice cream cone, including some drips, or uh, you can even think about this in terms of food photography. So a lot of food photography that is really popular will have the, you know, the thing with the bite taken out of it, the burger with the really melty cheese, the, uh, the foods that look like they do in real life tend to look more appetizing. So, um, yeah, choosing those subjects with some amount of imperfection, not trying to find a completely manicured subject is going to go a long way in that regard. Number four is to take photos of the subject in several different forms if you can. So again, going back to the apple example, you might want to take the whole apple, several different views of the whole apple. Then you might want to try 
buy uh, a bite out of the apple or the apple cut in half or the apple with a slice next to it, trying uh, several different configurations to give yourself options later on uh, will just make it that much easier. And this is something that I've just gotten kind of into the habit of doing over the years because if I happen to have um, a food on hand, a food item on hand, I think I might want to paint someday or I might need it for a client project at some point, I'll just take that opportunity to uh, grab some photos. And if you're already grabbing photos of the whole subject, it's just as easy to cut it in half or take a bite out of it or, or have some of those different contexts and that just gives you more information to work from later on. And number five, the, uh, the last tip is to um, keep in mind that if you are going to paint, uh, if you are going to shoot photos of and later paint uh, something that doesn't look like food or isn't immediately recognizable as food, whether it be the um, kind of abstract modernist cuisine or a cake that looks like a handbag or even a, a pile of different beige foods, if you need to paint something like that, like say for a client project, for example, Example, try to do your best to include cues to the viewer that it's food so that might mean that it's on a plate that it has a fork next to it that has a garnish like a little sprig of parsley or something um, including some of those visual cues or symbols even that uh, what the viewer is seeing is food will um, really make it read will make it easier for the viewer to read that as food uh, as opposed to um, not food <laughs> okay so that is it for my two part series on reference images. Again, the other video part one will be linked in the description box. And I do just want to reiterate again that all of these tips are things that uh, work for me and that are really taste specific. So you may have a very different taste, especially you know when we're talking about some of the tips for food illustration, you may do a very different kind of food illustration than I do. You may not want it to look imperfect. And, and in fact, actually, I um, sometimes will have clients that really strongly want the food to be completely perfect and pristine uh, without any uh, without any spots or tears or anything like that so um, there's a wide spectrum <laughs> for everything is fine any way that you want to approach it um, works but I, I hope that regardless that you were able to take some things that were helpful for you and for your process that you can apply in a way that that works for you and please do let me know in the comments if there were any one of these pointers that you found particularly helpful or was something that you hadn't thought about before and likewise if you have another pointer that, that you take into consideration when taking your own reference photos whether it be for food or botanicals or anything else please leave that in the comments as well so that we can all see and learn from one another's experience and lastly as always please do feel free to ask questions uh, leave comments or ideas for future videos. I am always taking suggestions and I love hearing what you guys think. If you like this video, please do hit the subscribe button, the thumbs up, uh, all of the good buttons to hit the bell, all of that. And uh, thank you again to uh, my patrons for supporting this video and to all of you for watching it. Um, and I hope everybody has a great week and I will see you all in the next video. Bye. Mm -hmm.